Hello and welcome back to my teaching on church planting. My name is Steve Hyde and I'm a missionary in Cambodia and I'd like to highlight that I'm a foreign missionary in this country. So I live in a country that I was not born in. So my culture, my original culture, is one that is different than the culture of the country that I am in. Today I'd like to talk about cultural considerations in sharing the gospel, cultural considerations in church planting. And I think it's very important for us to understand that. I'd like to start off by reading what the Apostle Paul said. Because you know in the time of Jesus, they were not in a monocultural society also, meaning one culture. The people, the God, Jesus was born in the nation of Israel amongst the Hebrew people. But then he ministered, well Jesus primarily ministered among the Jewish people. But in the region itself, very quickly as they moved around, there were people from other nations. Of course, in Jerusalem, being a large city in itself, there were people from all over the world. There are ten different nations mentioned on the day of Pentecost when Jesus was there. Uh, or I'm sorry, when the Apostle Peter, when he preached the message, there are ten different nations that were listed, that were there, that heard the gospel in their languages. And as the Apostle Paul moved around from city to city, he touched different cultures in Greece and Rome, in uh, what is today modern Turkey, and then in, into North Africa, uh, there in Egypt, in Tunisia, and places like that, modern day Tunisia. Um, those different places had different cultures of people. There were cultures of people all over the world. So the gospel did not start, it started in the nation of, of Israel, but then it quickly spread throughout the world. And Jesus was very clear that the gospel is for all nations. It's for all people to come to Christ. It's not a Jewish gospel. So we're not expected to become Jewish people, but we're also not expected to become Americans. We're not expected to become uh, British people. We're not expected to become Chinese or Korean or Filipino. The gospel of Jesus, of the kingdom of God, is one that impacts all cultures, and all cultures should be free to respond to the gospel in their own culture. But this also involves the message and the messenger who comes. We need to share the gospel in a way that they can understand. So today I'd like to talk about some cultural considerations that you need to consider when you share the gospel. So first I'd like to share what the Apostle Paul said in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 9 verses 19 through 23, but especially in verse 19. I'll highlight for that for you, but I'll read the, the whole passage. So 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 19 through 23, and this is what it says. Though I am free and belong to no man, I make myself a slave to everyone, to win as many as possible. To the Jews I became like a Jew, to win a Jew. To those who are under the law, I became like one under the law, though I myself am not under the law. So, so as to win those under the law. To those having the, the law, I became like the one as not having the law. To those not having the law, I became like one not having the law. Though I am not free from God's law, but am under Christ's law. So as to win those not having the law. To the weak, I became weak. To win the weak, I have become all things to all men, so that I, by all means possible, I might save some. I do this for the sake of the gospel, that I may share in its blessings. Let's go back to verse 22 there and read that one more time. To the weak, I became weak. To win the weak, I have become all things to all men, so that by all possible means I might save some. Clearly, the Apostle Paul, when he shared the gospel, knew that his message and the way he lived and, and the vessel that he is needed to change according to the culture. Now, in any time, there's always different nations that are more powerful than other nations. There's stronger nations and there are weaker nations. In the time uh, when Jesus was born on this earth, it was born in a time that they called Pax Romana. And the Roman nation was so powerful and strong that literally they had, they had, uh, 
they had subjugated the entire known world. And so they call it the Pax Romana or the peace of Rome because they had put everyone under them. And so there was no fighting, there was no uh, wars, there were no problems anywhere um, because Roman influence had, had power. But did, did the Church of Jesus Christ reflect Rome? Well, in Roman places it did, but not in Jewish places uh, and not in Greek places. In those places it reflected different cultures. Uh, and so um, before that, the Greek Empire was very powerful. Even before that, the Babylonian Empire was very powerful. And over the last uh, many hundred years, you can see uh, America didn't even exist. But over the last uh, at least 50, 60, 100 years, America has been uh, a large superpower in the world. And so the influence of American Christians has been significantly uh, stronger than other Christians. Before that it was the British Empire and before that it was the Portuguese and Spanish Im Im empires that had a significant influence and we can see coming up here shortly probably the, the Chinese Christians will begin to have more and more influence in the world because the nation itself is becoming a superpower and becoming stronger and because of their political influence in the world they can influence cultures and languages and they can influence the church as well. So I'd just like you to consider uh, when you've heard the gospel in your language you likely responded to the gospel in a way that was significant in your culture. When I heard the gospel uh, I heard it in a way that made an impact on my heart and I understood. Now I come from a society that's quite rational. Uh, they're uh, highly educated and they pride themselves in their education. So a lot of times when people share the gospel, it's almost like they're giving you facts and figures and, uh, and uh, they want you to understand that it's just logical that you believe in Jesus. You know, a logical person would understand that the gospel of Jesus Christ is true and logically Jesus has come to this earth uh, and he is logically only the, on the only one who can save us from our sins. Therefore, we should submit our lives to him and come to Christ. And many people in my uh, culture, my cognitive culture, my rationalistic, very American style culture, come to Christ in that way. But that's because of the culture of my nation. However, I live in a country that's not uh, rational thinking at all, not uh, logical thinking at all. And that's not bad. They, they respond better in terms of different ways to hear the gospel. They, they respond uh, better by seeing the gospel lived out in a person. They, they often, uh, even if they hear about Jesus and they hear that Jesus uh, is God and that he wants to save them from her sin, they are watching closely to see the life of the person. And so they don't want to make an instant decision, but they want to watch and they want to watch the person to see if, uh, if they live the life that Jesus has them to live. And if they, if they live in a way that would uh, identify themselves as being somebody who is a holy person or as a religious person. And if they're, uh, sometimes what the people are, are rejecting is not the message of the gospel, but they're rejecting the way the gospel was presented in the country. I'd like to share with you um, a couple of ways that I've learned over the years how I made a mistake in sharing the gospel because I didn't become all things to all people. I came in my American self and tried to share the gospel and I'll share with you about how other people have done the same. So uh, one of the ways, before you can see right now, I'm teaching you now, uh, I live in a very, very hot country. I'm in a uh, studio room now with, with no windows and it's, uh, it's not exactly the coolest place to be in. But uh, I have a long sleeve shirt on. I have a button down shirt and a collar. Why is that? Because anybody who's anybody in Cambodia uh, who's a teacher, who's somebody who is perceived as somebody who has knowledge and who has wisdom, is dressed in a way that is suitable to be a teacher. Now if somebody, if I stood before you today and I wore um, a, a, a sleeveless shirt and maybe some design on my shirt or maybe a t-shirt or something like that, you would probably receive me in a different way. You know, again, what I have before me now is my Bible. 
And when you can see my Bible, you know that when I'm teaching you and I'm reading from my Bible, you know that I'm reading from something that's special, a special book or a holy book. Now, if I just pulled out my phone and I was reading off of my phone and uh, just clicking through the apps, you might perceive that in a different way. You might perceive that mm, this guy is not really very holy, maybe it's not very religious, and so that maybe the message gets rejected just because of my appearance. Well, I want to follow Apostles Paul way. He said he became weak for the weak so that they would save some. So if their perception of a teacher and somebody who is religious is somebody who dresses well, who wears a long sh shirt, a button-down shirt, and is dressed in a certain way, to show they have wisdom. Well, I want to dress that way so that they will hear the message of the gospel that's intended. Now, many times I've had people come and visit us in Cambodia, and there's a method of, of sharing uh, the gospel to children in America where they will use uh, colored pieces of paper or they'll use beads and they'll pass out a necklace, and so they'll have different beads. Like, for example, there's a red one that means the blood of Christ, and there's a white one which refers to sin, and there's a, a green one which re refers to the glory of God, and a yellow one which speaks of, uh, um, let me see, yellow it speaks of maybe of heaven and Jesus coming, uh, and so there's, and black which speaks of sin, and so there's those different color beads, and they'll hand them out to children. Well, I want you to understand that from country to country, colors don't necessarily mean the same thing. For example, red in our country doesn't mean blood, doesn't mean the, the, the blood of Christ. It does, uh, where in America, the concept of, of red is uh, it's a color of war and it's a, color of, uh, it's a color of blood. In Cambodia, the color red means prosperity. And so when you give somebody a red bracelet and you want them to to think that that refers to the blood of Christ, they're thinking, wow, get rich, you know? And what is the color white? You want it to re represent holiness and to be without sin. But white in the color in Cambodia is the color of death. And so it has a different meaning. Just the color itself has a different meaning. Um, in, in America, purple is the, in a Western country, purple is the color of royalty. Here, uh, purple is a completely different meaning. Purple, um, it, it means somebody who cannot be trusted. And so purple is the color of somebody who is not honest and can't be trusted. But yellow is the color of royalty because yellow is the color of gold. And so gold is the color of royalty. And so all of our royal palaces and royal buildings are all, all painted yellow in our country. Um, there was one man who came from the nation of Singapore, which is a very high-tech and uh, uh, a nation that is everything is connected. Uh, when they came out with, um, you know, fiber optic, they were one of the first nations in the world to connect every house with fiber optics. And uh, as 5G is being put out now in the world, you know, their nation wants to be the first to have 5G that's going. And uh, and so they're always the the cutting edge. Well, one of these friends of mine came and he said, "I'd like to teach a little bit." Uh, so I can share the gospel with you, so I can have experience with that. First of all, I didn't know the language, but uh, he came with me, and I took him to a remote tribal village, and we were days. It took us it took us two or three days to get there. We had to go by boat. First, we went by car. Then we went by boat. Then we went by motorcycle, and in the end, we went by horse and walked to even get to this tribal village. And when we finally got to the tribal village, this man. Uh, there's no electricity there, there's no proper roads there, there's no running water there except for the stream that was running by where we took our ba baths in every day. Uh, there was nothing modern in this country, yet he comes from one of the most modern countries on the earth. And so he decided that he wanted to share with them. And so he got up and wanted me to translate for them. And, and you know what he shared on? He, he wanted to share on the dangers of the internet and that they should be careful on the internet. I didn't even know how to translate the word internet so that they could understand. And he's like, well, just explain it to them. 
explain what to them <laughs> that there's fiber optic cables somewhere floating around and there it, it was a good, complete disaster because he took what is common in his country of Singapore and brought it into the nation of Cambodia which at the time wasn't common at all and uh, and tried to bring it in and the message was lost because the cultures could not relate to each other and so um, there was another time when I was actually quite ashamed, uh, having lived in Cambodia for a long time. I know that uh, Cambodians do not like uh, aggressive behavior. They don't like loud behavior. Uh, for, for children playing and things like that, they don't mind. But the adults are often uh, very uh, stoic and uh, they don't like expressions of, of, of culture. And so I was quite shocked to pull up an intersection, a main intersection, on uh, in Phnom Penh on my motorcycle and there was a foreigner holding a sign shouting on the side of the road and I couldn't understand him at all. He looked like uh, Asian, maybe Korean or something like that and he was screaming and screaming ah, 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 and he's holding a sign and I looked at the sign and the sign had some small letters in two languages. One was Korean, I didn't know what it said and then on top of that was the Khmer, which I could read and it said Jesus loves you. And I thought, oh my goodness, what is this man doing? Is he demon possessed? You know, and he's screaming. And I tried to listen to what he was doing. And I tried to listen to the words. And he was actually screaming out in English. As motorcycles were going by, he was screaming out in broken Korean English. So not even pure English, you know, he was screaming out in English. Jesus loves you! Jesus loves you! Jesus loves you! And I was horrified because I know that everyone on the street is thinking, this is a religious nut job. This man is completely insane. And this guy, this Korean guy standing on the corner is probably thinking, I want them to understand that Jesus loves them. But what he brought from his culture in Korea with his broken language, wrong language, wrong culture, wrong environment, actually was an affront. It was an affront to the gospel. He didn't become all things to all people. He just shoved his culture in an ugly way onto other people. And it was horrendous. I pulled up quickly next to him and I said, please stop. Please stop. Please don't come back here. And I even considered to call the police to go and arrest him so that he would leave. When we share the gospel in a country, we need to make sure that the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ that they received is the message that Jesus intends them to be. And we need to strip away our culture when we share with them the gospel. So if you come from a very rationalistic culture and their culture is one which responds more to, actually the Bible is written in a, a cultural context which is much more similar to, to what we experience in Cambodia. Uh, the Bible is written in a very agricultural terminology, agricultural lifestyle. Uh, it's written in that way. Well, that matches very closely to what Cambodia is going. So I try to teach and live out and try to preach even the way Jesus did. As he walked along the road and he saw a fig tree, he, he, he used the illustration of the fig tree to, to, to share the gospel with them. I do the same thing. I could talk about agricultural things like in mango season, I'll talk about mangoes and I can talk about coconuts and I can use that to bring them to the gospel. But also, as Jesus went, you remember what he did when he preached the kingdom of the God, he went and he healed the sick. He lived it out with his life. He lived a certain way with his life. He lived in poverty because he didn't want to be perceived as a wealthy and arrogant person who had political power, political passion to influence other people. So he lived out poverty. He could have lived like a king. He was God. He was creator of heavens and earth. He could have lived any way he wanted to, but he chose to live in poverty. So Jesus lived a certain way. He lived among the people. He became incarnational amongst the people, and so did the Apostle Paul. And that's something very important for us to do, is to be incarnational amongst the people that we want to live. That means we become a part of the people we want to live. So in Cambodia, I want to show the gospel to people in a Cambodian way, not in an American way, not in a, in a cognitive way or a mental way or a rational way to them, because I know that's not the way they respond. I want to present the gospel in a Cambodian way.
So as I live out the gospel in my country here in Cambodia, my adopted country that I'm in now, I need to live out the gospel. I need to share the gospel in a way that they will understand, which involves the way that they dress. Uh, shorts are not appropriate for a teacher and for a religious person to wear, so we need to keep covered. So I wear clothes, clothing which is appropriate for uh, what they would perceive as somebody who has an important message and something to teach to them. Tight clothes are, are, are deemed inappropriate often in their culture. Um, most men and women wear long sleeve shirts and so I tend to wear long sleeve shirts here. Uh, we always remove our hats when we talk to people or we talk to important people. So many people in America, they like to wear especially uh, baseball caps that they put on their head and that kind of stuff. And even they like to teach wearing a baseball cap. In the culture in Cambodia, it's very inappropriate to wear a baseball cap around any kind of adult or especially inside of a religious building. You would never wear a baseball cap. In Cambodia, most homes that we go into and every religious building we go to into, we remove our shoes. In so many churches also, people will come to the church and they remove their shoes. Uh, and so it's a, it's a sign of respect. You don't wear your shoes into a place which is considered to be a place where God lives and God resides. And so uh, it's a way to show respect by taking off your shoes. And so even when it's difficult sometimes to take off our shoes, we need to take off our shoes because it shows respect to the people. And those are all things. Why do we do that? so that they won't reject us for the cultural, um, the cultural problems that we're bringing or the cultural offense that we're bringing, but that they, we, can, we can adjust to their culture so that they can receive the message of Jesus Christ, which is a message of love and compassion for them. But if we bring a cultural affront to them, that causes them to reject not the gospel of Jesus, but to reject our cultural presentation of the gospel. Now, also, we need to consider that sometimes I, I work a lot in, in literature and translation and publishing of Christian materials, and so um, I've learned many things over the years about language, which is very important. In, in America, they often say, God bless you, and people understand that as, I'm a Christian, and therefore when I say, God bless you, I mean, Jesus bless you. But in Cambodia, if you say, God bless you, it doesn't really mean anything. Buddhists can say God bless you. Hindus can say God bless you. Everything is a God. You are a God. Everyone is a God. Uh, I've been called a God many, many times in Cambodia. Simply if you help other people, sometimes they'll call you a God. Because in their worldview, there is a plurality of gods. There is not a singular God. And so when, when Christians come from other countries here and they say this, just the simple words, God bless you, the meaning is not understood in the same way. So rather than saying, God bless you, I specifically use the words, God, Jesus, bless you. God, Jesus, bless you. So I specifically add the word, God, Jesus, so that they know exactly who I'm talking about. Because if I just say, God, bless you, they understand in a different way. Well, there's other words. For example, like peace, which is understood, uh, peace in Cambodia is more of an absence of war. Uh, and, and, uh, and so when we're trying to teach about biblical peace, uh, we're understanding a, a condition of the heart. And so that's something we need to express in a different way. Christianity is called Sathna Kru, which uh, uh, it's, it's not the followers of Jesus. And so when I want people to become a follower of Jesus, I use different words than, than using Christianity because if we just translate literally Christianity, it means the religion of Christ. And we don't want people to understand this as simply being another religion. Salvation, sankru, when we talk about salvation, it's understood, if I just use the basic word salvation, it's understood differently than what I intend. When Jesus comes to to save the world, he saves them from sin. But when I use the word sankru in Cambodian, what they're hearing is, I may be offering them some free food <laughs> because I can save them from their physical plight of poverty. And so we need to be careful the, the, the words that we use. Well, then we come into things that are often confusing for them. 
for example, baptism. Uh, we, we have to teach them what it is because they don't know what baptism is. Uh, it's not something that's, that's, that's uh, common in their culture. For example, there's things like uh, prayer. So in, in Buddhist, when we talk about prayer and we say, uh, you can, you know, you can just pray to God, you know. <laughs> Who knows what they'll understand if you say pray to God, because when they pray to God, they, they bow their head and they, they have a monk come and the monk, he chants, Dong, e, ro, e, ro, lo, e, ro, no, no, no. He chants in a way that uh, he uses a religious language that they don't know. And so people's concept of prayer is simply listening to uh, or meditating on the sounds that come from a religious person's mouth. But it's not a deep communication with the Lord Jesus Christ uh, ourselves, that we can speak to ourselves. So these are all cultural considerations that you need to come in. Don't just simply run over a word and expect they understand it. Because the word has, when they receive that word, they receive it into the cultural context which they're familiar with. So prayer in Christian context and prayer in a Buddhist context is extremely different. And so we want to teach them slowly, patiently, and we want to become all things to them so that they can hear the message of the gospel. Simply things like heaven, forgiveness, sins, demons and spirits. These are all things that, that they will understand in their own, their own culture. Even the way when a religious person teaches, it's understood in a different way. And so uh, when we w want to teach them and disciple them, we have to go at extreme lengths to understand what they're tr understanding from what we're speaking. But we need to develop models of communication and words of communication which can communicate the message. So if we take a package, for an example, a way that they use for sharing the gospel in America. And you simply take that into uh, a place like Cambodia or Africa or places like that, and you expect that it's going to be successful. It's likely that they're understanding something completely different to what you're talking about. The way you understand it because of your culture is different than the way they're receiving it because of their culture. That's why it's so important for us to contextualize the gospel message. Don't just take products and ways of sharing the gospel in the West and expect that that will be successful in your country. You pray to the Holy Spirit. You ask God to reveal to you and to give you a heart of understanding so that you can share the gospel to people in a way that is contextualized so that they can understand the gospel message in a way because our goal is to impact their hearts so that the culture of their country is changed as well and so I would just like to encourage you again and read one more time for you the Apostle Paul's uh, methodology of contextualization he said to the weak I became weak to win the weak I have become all things to all people, so that by all possible means I might save some. Our goal is to give the gospel to people, not to say how many people that we've shared the gospel to, but that their lives will be saved by the love of Jesus Christ, by His perfect uh, salvation and grace and mercy on their lives, that He will save them. And so if they can't hear the message and they don't understand the message in the right way, then we as a communicator have communicated it wrongly. And so we as the communicators of God's message need to consider so many things when we think about the, the message of Christ. They need to see our heart. They need to see um, the message behind us. They need to see Christ revealed in us. But we need to give them the message of Jesus Christ in a cultural package that they can understand. So contextualization of the gospel message to impact the church and to, to spread the church and to pr spread the, the kingdom of God into their country is extremely important. And I thank you for considering that when you uh, are presenting the gospel in your cultural context. Don't just take things from Western countries or from other countries and expect that they'll be understood in the same way in your country. Pray and ask God that He would help you to be sensitive to their culture and so that you can present the gospel in a way that they can respond to the gospel and not reject 
your culture, but they can, they can respond to the gospel of Jesus Christ in a way that you presented well, in a way that you become all things to all people. Thank you so much for being a part of this teaching today, and I hope you enjoyed it, and I hope that it will bless you as you share the gospel and plant churches in your context.